You know what? Screw stock timpani drum roll sound effects. Time to activate the real theme song. This really raises the question as to why I didn't do this earlier. There were some movies. Terrible movies. Movies so awful. No one would touch. Then came a Matthew. Sad little Matthew. Matthew decided these movies to watch. For every good movie, there's at least ten bad. Matthew really dragged himself through the crap to find the worst ones there are to be had. Today's episode, nine minutes. <sighs> Absurdly special thanks to my friend James for that beautiful new opening. He is on SoundCloud. He is great. Check him out. His link is in the description. And speaking of James, remember when I said we were renting a movie and the cashier recommended Fateful Findings? Well, we went back to that video rental store and they recommended a little movie that had just been sent to them from some no-name director with no explanation. And let me tell you, this is gold. Nine Minutes is a 65-minute film. False advertising. There I said it. Directed by indie filmmaker Yahari Nichols through his company Skywalk Entertainment. They specialize in no-budget genre films. And by no budget, I don't mean low, low budget. I mean I actually think this film had no budget. And by literally, I mean literally, literally, not hyperbolic, literally. Seriously, this movie has the potential to be the next Faithful Findings, and as of the writing of this episode, it doesn't even have an IMDb page. Skywalker Entertainment has only three likes on their Facebook page. That's sad that this show might actually be more popular than the film I'm reviewing. And I can barely get all 27 subscribers to watch my videos. This film is so no budget, it came to me straight from the director. He even signed the envelope. All the information I have on this comes straight from the DVD itself or the website I bought it off of. So according to the box, it's from 2013. In the Meet the Director bonus feature, Nichols says he wrote the film with the intent of having family members fill several roles because they didn't know about his job as a filmmaker. And based on his website, Nine Minutes was his first movie, so I guess he didn't know about it either. I don't know, the way he talks in this segment makes it seem like maybe he has made other movies, but I find no proof of that. And if it's not on the internet, it didn't happen. In fact, I can barely find proof that this movie exists. Though I have it on good authority that it does. It seems like the only other movies this guy's made are Ten Minutes, a sequel to this film, and the upcoming superhero movie, Raptor though his IMDb page lists an acting credit in Omaha the Movie and nothing else. So, maybe this is a different Yahari Nichols. The box says rated PG on the cover, which I seriously doubted was official, as the MPAA like to slap their logo on these things, plus then it'd have some precedent for an IMDb page, and there's lots of stuff here that wouldn't be in a PG movie. But on the back, it straight up admits, not rated by the MPAA. That said, the DVD at least looks presentable, unlike Cool Cat Saves the Sticker over here. So are you ready to see what some dude from South Carolina made over a weekend for ten bucks? Then you shouldn't have clicked on this video! The movie opens on the director's email address. Hey guys, check out my new movie and please email me, I'm so lonely. So the movie starts, and no, this isn't a terrible DVD rip like with Flyin' Ryan. This movie is actually presented in glorious, low-quality vision. Listen, it might seem unfair to review something with such an obvious lack of budget, but when even my show is doing better, I think it's fair. And trust me, Nichols would be better off with even lower resolution, because even in frickin' 10.8p, I can tell both characters are the same actor. That's right, Yahari Nichols plays four characters. Who plays four characters in their own production, right guys? What? Huh? Did you say something? Forget it. But don't worry, the split screen looks amazing. <laughs> Will I ever stop being a jackass? You know, sometimes I feel bad about the gun effects in the Rambo Christmas special, but when I watch films like this... Or this... 
my personal favorite, this, I tend to not feel as bad. And shooting trees totally makes metal bullet holes. Makes perfect sense. And how can neither of these people think to wait until the other one is fully exposed? Attention all units. Brandon Gilly is headed for the docks. Check every boat down there. Oh, stop acting like you're giving orders to anyone. Oh, and it gets worse because he goes from giving orders to no one to no one giving orders to no one. He jumped in or he fell in. Check that water. This is the main character, Andrew Price, searching for the main villain, Brandon. His main joke is that he has jerry curls. All I need is some curl activator. You got some curl activator? I don't know. I guess the jerry curl broke its fall. Yeah, and he dripped jerry curl activator all over my couch and on my floor. Man, my jerry curl was itching for days. There's more, but I'll spare you. Meanwhile, Brandon the super hacker, because of course he is, hacks into some top secret files in the same font as the title. And I guess he's using the old Lappy 486 because everything's text-based. Then he meets up with a drug dealer named Randy, also played by Nichols, and oh my god. First, that split screen isn't even close. Second, this is an over-the-shoulder shot. And I'm just left there wondering why you would ever split screen someone's shoulder. Third, it's shot reverse shot. You don't even really need the shoulder there. You put in more effort to suck. Let's just say it's unofficial government business. I might get shot in the process. So I figure if I do get shot, might as well be high. Because it's super easy to hack into national and international secrets while you're high on cocaine. And yes, this is our master hacker. This guy who acts like Gary Oldman's character from True Romance, but somehow even more of a tool. Brandon makes it to one of the people he needs houses and just... stands outside spouting inane dialogue. And I don't know a lot about fitness, but I'm pretty sure you're supposed to turn the treadmill on. So finally, around the ten minute mark... So over nine minutes in... We get a character who isn't played by Yahari Nichols. This is, I think, the police chief. I don't know, this film's gonna do fuck all to make them actually look like police at any point. It's from her we learned that ten former employees of the Ellington Corporation received plaques that have a code on the back, and when put together, they open an account with... One million dollars. And you think the key to catching Brandon is by finding the people who are on this list who used to work for the Pellington Corporation, who just happened to be... Seven of my relatives. Get it? Because they're played by his actual relatives? Also, thanks for spelling the plot out. And his boss recommends he team up with a pimp named Antonio, who's apparently the second best hacker after Brandon. Are street criminals just way more tech-savvy than I thought? I thought hackers were supposed to be, like, scrawny nerds, not quarter-assed Tarantino characters. So we finally go back to Brandon trying to get into this house to get the plaque he needs. I want to talk about your money. Give me all you got. <laughs> okay, that one was kind of funny. On purpose this time. Wait, what is this? You green screened a framed picture? Or is that a window? Either way, it didn't need to be green screened. Then again, I can't really complain since it seems they can't even afford a basketball. Well, you could have green screened that. Well, the over the shoulder split screen at least matches here, even though these were clearly shot at different times of day. Because the last time I saw you, it wasn't good. You shot me. You shot me in the booty. Dude, if you're gonna look straight into the camera, get darker shades. So Price talks to Randy about Brandon, and I really like how different Randy and Brandon are, with their fake wigs, goofy voices, and sunglasses. Hell, their names are even kinda similar. Oh great, back to the screened window. And the reverse shot left the green screen in. So we finally meet Antonio, and guess what? 
It's Yohari Nichols in a wig and sunglasses doing a fake voice. Hey, Matthew. It's me, a different character. Right you are, totally different character. Dude, I'm right here. Yeah, but you don't wear sunglasses. You justify a new character. Mm. Split screen is not that hard. Did we change shirts? And for a movie that's only 65 minutes, it sure does have a lot of padding. Maybe the original script was only 9 minutes. Then suddenly Antonio is in a different outfit, even though no passage of time has been signified, and he's getting arrested when Price shows up and says he needs Antonio. Why everybody want to take me in today? I ain't did nothing to nobody. That's because nobody likes you. What? I didn't do anything. That's because no one likes you. Then Price explains the plot. Again. They go to visit Price's aunt via a driving shot taken through a dirty windshield, though it's hardly the first time that's happened in this film. And this is the best the split screen looks all movie. Only because it's indoors and the lighting matches. Nothing important really happens. Then he goes to his sister's house. Again, nothing happens. Well, nothing happens until Brandon shows up and starts firing without aiming. Oh, get down. What is this nonsense? The metal bullets in the tree were at least PNGs, what's all the black area here? And yeah, they don't move with the door. Also, doors are great at stopping bullets. I ain't signed up for no wild, wild west gunfights. That, he said it! Cue the meme! Haha, <laughs> that will always be relevant. Why did you choose a pimp? Well, you know something, Andrew. I really don't consider myself to be a pimp. I'm more like a uh, old playboy slash street executive. Okay, two jokes landed. That's better than most Friedberg and Seltzer movies. At least I hope those were jokes. I'm gonna need at least two of those codes off the back of them plex. Oh man, Lenovo? A true sign of a low-quality production. Then he goes to another aunt's house, and by plaque, apparently they meant picture frame with nothing in it. G come on, you couldn't even print a fake certificate. Wait a minute, are they wearing the same belt? Man, I can't believe this movie would do something so lazy. Nothing happens here. Again. Repetition. It never gets old. Finally, at his uncle's, something substantial is added to the story. Women can't add anything to a story, am I right, fellas? He tells Price that the plaques don't access... One million dollars. But instead, America's nuclear missiles. So America's nuclear codes will be in the hands of this brain-dead egomaniac with fake hair, and you know where I'm going with that joke. So as he talks, Uncle Rod flashes back to Brandon typing. And launch a missile. Oh my god. I thought Faithful Finding's fake typing was bad, but this... This is another level. This is glorious. Then Price repeats what we just learned to his boss. Repetition. It never gets old. And speaking of... Of all the shots to reuse, and less than two minutes later, I love it! Price and Antonio make it back to police headquarters, and Antonio starts hitting on the chief. You need a part-time job? I got openings. Yeah, I need a part-time job. Here's my resume. You still hiring? Uh... Yep, police can just threaten people at gunpoint in a police station. Especially when they're helping the police. And finally, Antonio starts hacking, almost like he was an extraneous character up to this point. And it never affects the plot even remotely that he's a pimp. That could have been dropped entirely. 
And I guess while he hacks, the chief is just gonna stand there. But Antonio and Brandon find out that if you try hacking the missiles long enough, you run into what they call passwords, but are actually security questions. But whatever. And the only people who know the answers to these questions are Price's aunt and uncle. So Price and Tony run over, but they're too late. And it took 50 minutes, but someone finally disappeared behind the split screen. It was doomed to happen. Alright, alright, come on, Andrew. I know you got a piece on you. Yeah, throw your piece on it. Thank you very much. Uh, he's about to take over America's nuclear missiles. I think it's worth risking getting shot. And look at that, he gets in and launches a missile at Spain. Why Spain? I could think of at least 20 better countries to bomb. But it turns out the missiles don't shoot immediately, so there's time for the military to... <laughs> I'm kidding. A pimp has to hack in and abort it. We have nine minutes. Ah, she said it! She said the thing! Opa! And rather amusingly, this is nine minutes from the end of the film. Man, they nailed it with the suspenseful music here. So the day is saved, Brandon escapes because this obviously needed a sequel, and we're left on another glorious split screen. That is seriously the worst it has looked all film. Then Yahari Nichols gets a full screen credit for all four of his characters. That's nine minutes. Ooh, what a mess. Seriously, I'm not sure whether to laugh, get pissed, or just feel bad, and parts of this movie make me do all three. It's clear Yahari Nichols is into filmmaking, no one would do something this ambitious otherwise, he just really doesn't understand how to do it. This film is painfully overambitious in places it really didn't need to be, and even with a higher budget, this plot's overly convoluted and the acting is really bad. See, when I reviewed Ben and Arthur, I kinda overlooked a lot of the technicals, like the awful cinematography because of how bad the story and dialogue were. But here, I overlook a lot of bad dialogue and story because of how bad the technicals are. I can say at least all of Nichols' characters are pretty funny to watch, except when they're actually trying to be funny. Honestly, I think there's a lot of potential for this as a so bad it's good movie. Though it'll probably never break the mainstream the way The Room or Troll 2 have. But for those of us on the fringes watching the craziest shit imaginable, I'd recommend this, and I would love to see it become a sort of underground, underground classic, like Cool Cat. And the best part is, it's part of a trilogy. And it is just part one to a movie trilogy that I created. Um, there's nine minutes, there's the first sequel, ten minutes, and then there's part three, which I'm actually looking to begin production on within the next year and a half. Part three? What could they possibly call it? Anyways, I'm Matt, and until next time, I'm going to be working on this list of 20 countries to bomb. Uh, France, obviously, Russia for the Cold War, North Korea for being assholes, Iraq and Iran for starting wars, Britain just to prove how independent we are, France again, Europe for being a country. I gave myself an alley-oop. I call it the Randy-oop. Oops! Oh, that's what you call it. Oh, okay. The Randy-oop. That's a new one. Nine bonus points to anyone who caught the camera reflection in the TV. Repetition.